In at number 5 we have Space Mountain. There are a surprising amount of urban legends surrounding this ride at Disney World which is odd, it is just a ride after all right? Nothing strange about it. According to legend one rider was decapitated while on Space Mountain because he supposedly stood up while riding. What a f***ing idiot. Now this is only a little bit true, there was a decapitation but it was on a test dummy, not a real person. No person has ever been killed while riding Space Mountain. However there is another dark legend that surrounds this ride. According to legend on Space Mountain you can find Mr. One Way. Some accounts describe Mr. One Way as a red haired man with a red face, with stories stating that he hangs out in the line for Space Mountain. But this differs depending on who you ask, according to video footage Mr. One Way will sometimes get onto the ride with other passengers, grabbing an available seat. However, it is said that he disappears right before you reach the final tunnel at the end of the ride. On top of that, there is supposedly a second ghost called Disco Debbie, who is also said to haunt Space Mountain, and according to some riders, she glows in the dark. Very freaky indeed. Coming in at number 4 we have Magnolia Creek Lake. Magnolia was once a thriving riverport town in southern Wakula County, Florida which was established all the way back in the 1820s and is now classified as an extinct city by the state library and archives of Florida. All that remains of the city is a cemetery with the last known burial being back in 1859. Magnolia Creek Lane is a narrow road fit for one car at a time south of Montverde on the west side of Lake Apopka. According to legend the road and surrounding Lake is haunted by around 200 passengers who were killed in a train wreck. However, many have attempted to find evidence of this, but none has ever been found, yet the legend continues. Now while the road appears to be built on an old train track, the only documented railroad ran slightly north of the location. Now this road is supposedly where all kinds of horrible things happened back in the 1890s and according to some locals at the creek that runs to Lake Apopka, you can hear the loud screams in the woods, however when you get closer they move farther away. The stream are said to be that of the train crew that died. However, skeptics believe this is actually sound that is being reflected from another place. According to a local, Michelle, she said, I quote, My cousin went to Montverde Academy and heard about this road that runs off 455 that used to be a railroad bed. And they say that if you go down there at night, you can hear ghostly sounds and see eerie shadows of people walking on the road. I don't know for sure about this because I never went there, so it is just what I heard. Coming in at number 3, I4 Dead Zone. Interstate 4 is a highway in Florida that spans 132 miles with it running from Tampa all the way to Daytona Beach. Now the interstate is frequented daily by folks heading to work and those on their way to Disney World. Now while it is a popular highway, it is also another nickname for it, the dead zone, an area where folks need to be particularly careful. This area of the highway has been the location of many accidents, electronic malfunctions, as well as supposed ghost sightings. So why exactly is this spot so dangerous and filled with so much paranormal activity. Well this is because this quarter mile of highway was built over a grave site and as we know from movies a disturbed grave site means bad news bears, it means you're in for a nasty surprise, it means you're gonna die. Don't believe it? Well oddly enough on the very first day the new interstate was opened a tractor trailer carrying frozen goods lost control and crashed directly above the disturbed graves of people who had died from yellow fever. It is believed that around 1500 to 2000 accidents have occurred on the highway since 1960 which is a lot. And worse still, many of those accidents resulted in death and between a 24 month period there were around 44 car accidents resulting in approximately 65 people being injured. Some locals fear this area of the highway so much that they actually take a much longer route around it. On top of all of this, back in the 1950s a young boy was said to have disturbed the graves and the following night he was killed by a drunk driver. And to add insult to injury, the driver was never caught. Come in at number 2 we have the devil's chair, also known as the haunted chair. This is an urban legend hailing from folklore that is attached to a class of funerary or memorial sculpture common throughout the United States during the 19th century. Now these chairs were known as the mourning chairs for visitors to cemeteries to sit on when visiting loved ones. However since then cemeteries have provided benches for similar purposes. Once the original purpose of these chairs fell out of fashion, superstition quickly developed in association with sitting in the chair. For example, some young people dare one another 
to visit the site, most often after dark or at midnight, or in some cases on Halloween. Stories state that if you sit in the chair at these specific times, something awful will happen, with people fearing that they will be punished. In Florida specifically, the Devil's Chair is located in Casadega, Florida, and is a graveside bench in the cemetery that borders Casadega as well as Lake Helen. According to legend, an unopened can of beer left on the chair will be empty by morning. Now, in some stories, the can has already been opened, and in others, the liquid is simply gone through the unopened top. On top of that, it is said that the devil will sometimes appear to anyone bold enough to sit in the chair itself. So, if you do decide to visit the chair at night and take a seat expecting to meet the devil, just be sure to have a beer in hand ready for him because it is said that he will be expecting one. As am I, all the time. I would like a beer. Maybe that's why I'm evil. I'm the devil. And finally, coming in at number one, Legend of the Skunk Ape. Also known as the Swamp Cabbage Man, Swamp Ape, Stink Ape, Florida Bigfoot, and Louisiana Bigfoot, this is a creature that is said to inhabit Florida and is named for its appearance and for its unpleasant odor that is said to accompany it. The ape has supposedly been a part of Florida folklore since the settler period, which is absolutely insane. One of the first reports of the skunk ape in Florida came from the year 1818. A report spoke of a man sized monkey or ape raiding stores and stalking fishermen. This became particularly common in the 60s and 70s, with one sighting occurring in 1974, which spoke of a large, foul smelling, hairy ape like creature, which was said to run upright on two legs in the neighborhood of Dade County, Florida. However, some people were skeptical, including investigator Joe Nickel, who stated that these reports may represent a black bear and that other sightings may in fact be hoaxes or misidentification of wildlife. In terms of appearance, the creature is said to resemble the Sasquatch of the Pacific Northwest. However, the skunk ape is said to be shorter in comparison, has long patches of fur on the shoulders and arm, and is often described as a mottled, rusty red colour, as opposed to the Sasquatch's brown and black coat. In at number 5, we have Empire State Building Bermuda Triangle. We've all heard about the Bermuda Triangle. Also known as the Devil's Triangle, it is loosely defined as being a region in the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean. A number of aircraft and ships are said to have disappeared under mysterious serious circumstances. Since then, planes change their flight path to avoid the triangle. Others avoid going anywhere near it altogether. But did you know New York has its own version of the Bermuda Triangle? It is located in Midtown, more specifically a large radius around the Empire State Building. Starting in 2008, drivers started to complain about the five block radius around the Empire State. Their cars would inexplicably die and refuse to start up again. It was almost every day, says Ronnie Yak Kabovich, manager of NYC Tire and Auto Care. He went on to explain that he would pick up the cars and tow them outside of the radius and they would suddenly start to work as normal. His best guess is that the radio signals from the broadcast beacon on the tower were disabling alarm systems in cars and preventing them from starting. But if that was so, why did this only start in 2008? The Empire State Building was opened in 1931, so why did this start so recently? I guess we will never know what is causing the phenomenon, maybe just avoid the Area if you can. In at number four, Super Brats of Hurricane Sandy. One New Yorker told the story of him and his roommates. They had lived peacefully in a fifth floor loft for years with barely a cockroach invading the space. Then, the winter after Hurricane Sandy, the noises began scratching and scurrying. I walked into the kitchen one day and saw a rat the size of a small cat crawling across our food shelves, Kevin says. Traps and an exterminator proved ineffective. It was baffling that the rats would find their way to the fifth floor. Then, the roommates read reports about rats fleeing inland from flooded subway tunnels after Hurricane Sandy. A theory was going around that the weaker rats were wiped out and the surviving rodents bred a new generation of tougher, meaner super rats. There are reports of super rats even today. Some businesses demand that the city steps in and does something as outside dining became more normal within the last year. The diners were being harassed by the giant rats. Many diners have had to leave due to the dangerous nature of the giant animals. They claimed the rats were getting increased increasingly hungry with the lack of tourism, leaving them with less to feed off on the streets. The city continues to claim that these super rats do not exist despite the number of sightings and photos of the giant rodents. Many live in fear that the rats might make their way into the
the apartments as they are harder to kill than the usual infestation. In at number 3 we have Cropsy. In the mid 90s Ariel Abramowitz went to camp across from the notorious disused mental institution Willowbrook in Staten Island. She recalls counsellors taking campers to an old building on the site, with something like blood smeared on the walls. They spooked them with tales of a boogeyman named Cropsy. Allegedly he was a respected community member, he has a family and a child who he loved. One summer he sent his child to the local camp. His son was later confirmed to have died at the camp. This sent the man mad. He disappeared from his life. No one knew where he had gone, but before he left, he vowed to get revenge on the other kids and campers. He was later found and taken to a mental hospital. The next time we would hear of him, he was described as a homicidal madman, an escaped mental patient with a hook for a hand who hunted children and dragged them back to the tunnel system that lay under the abandoned ruins of the old Seaview Hospital, a former tuberculosis sanitarium. Soon the urban legend would be unmasked as Andre Rand. Rand worked as a janitor at the Willowbrook State School on Staten Island, a place whose name alone has the power to frighten adults and children alike. The institution, built as a respite for children with intellectual disabilities, was revealed to be a living hell in the 1970s, although authorities wouldn't close the school until 1987. Rand had a long rap sheet of crimes against children. In 1983, he went to jail again after kidnapping a bus full of kids from the local YMCA and driving them to an airport. And though there wasn't enough physical evidence to charge him, police already suspected him in the disappearances of at least four other Staten Islanders. To this day, none of the bodies have been found. Rand's story and that of Cropsey continues to fascinate and horrify tri-state residents to this day. Coming in at number 2 we have Haunted Dakota. The Dakota building set the standard for Upper West Side apartment living, built at a time when the upper classes were only just becoming familiar with the concept of living in an apartment. It was known for having famous artists as residents and the board were very picky about who they allowed to live there. One of the most famous couples to live at the Dakota was John Lennon and his wife Yoko Ono. Years after John Lennon was shot dead in front of his Central Park West apartment building the Dakota, his widow Yoko Ono saw his ghost sitting at his white piano. She claims he turned to her and said, don't be afraid, I'm still with you. When he was alive, Lennon himself claimed to have spotted a figure wandering the halls of the Dakota, whom he referred to as the crying lady ghost. Other residents are said to have encountered the specter of a little girl, about 7 years old, smiling and laughing and greeting people in the hallways. The Dakota's original owner, Edward Clark, had an interest in the paranormal and would often host seances to communicate with the dead. The more you play with the paranormal, the more likely you are to experience paranormal activity in the future, says paranormal researcher. She believes that when people are murdered suddenly and violently, their spirits linger. In John Lennon's case, his life was cut short in his prime. He was only 40 years old. Someone like him was happy to be alive. He was working, he had a small child, he had unfinished business. It's a prime recipe for a classic haunting. And finally in at number 1 we have mole people. There are around 700 miles of subway tracks underneath New York City. Did you know that the large sections of the track that isn't used is home to the mole people? Thousands of homeless people and families have created a community underground. The mole people are living under popular parts of town without the people who are walking above, even knowing they are there. They travel under cover of darkness as not to be evicted from their underground homes. Ever since the Great Depression, there have been many homeless people in New York City. During the difficult period, people started using the subway tunnels as a place to live. The places where homeless people live are dangerous. Rodents and reptiles lurk through the tunnels. There are debris and other hazards in the dark. Plus, the darkness conceals criminals, and mole people are often the victims of attacks. Thieves even steal what little they have. The entrances to the subway tunnels are easily accessible by anyone who has the desire to venture into them. There are numerous entrances throughout the city, however it is illegal to enter and going into them can result in criminal charges. Just like any place that numerous people live, the mole people form communities. Most of them look after each other, but there is also a kind of hierarchy. Most of them are very territorial over the section of the tunnels where they live. After all, it is their home. There are couples and even families that live underground. The sad part is these people risk losing their kids if a authorities find out they do not have a place to live. So the families living in the subway do their best to stay concealed. People are not the only ones living in the subway tunnels under New York City though. Many animals live beneath the streets. Some of the mole people even domesticate these animals and live with them. These animals keep them company in the very isolated and lonely place they call home. The mole people do anything
anything they can to eat and obtain the things they need. It's difficult for them though. They have to wait until it's dark to emerge from their homes. If authorities see them, they risk getting in trouble. Throughout the years, the city has made efforts to clean sections of the subway tunnels. However, the task is so vast that many abandoned areas remain untouched, especially the parts of the system that are no longer in use. As the saying goes, out of sight, out of mind. Coming in at number five, we have the werewolf of defiance. During the summer of 1972, the people of defiance claimed they were being terrorized by a werewolf. On July 25th, 1972, Ted Davis, a railroad worker, noticed something strange. He saw two hairy, huge paws on the ground in front of him. Confused and likely scared, he slowly raised his eyes and saw before him a creature at least six feet tall, hunched over and holding a large wooden board. Before Ted had a moment to react, he hit Ted on the shoulder and ran away. Just a few days after, Ted and his colleague spotted the return of the unknown creature, and again in the next following day, there was another report. A panic began to spur through the town and newspapers about the strange sightings. With all the sightings, it was agreed that the werewolf was large and humanoid. There were enough reports that the Defiance Ohio Police Department had to open an investigation into werewolves in the area. It is even reported in the various newspapers in Ohio. Eventually, after days of looking with no result, the case was closed. Many people thought it was a prank, but during this experience, people were actually afraid that there were either a creature or some individual dressing up and attacking people. The sightings always happened at night, generally by the train tracks. A couple of women said it would try to get into their houses by rattling the doorknobs. The animal was said to be huge, hairy, and dressed in rags. In at number four, we have Moonville Tunnel. Located in southern Ohio, these haunted tunnels were once used for multiple railroads. The abandoned coal mining town of Moonville near southeastern Ohio was founded in 1856. At its peak, the town was home to about 100 miners and their families. Little remains of the abandoned coal mining town of Moonville except for a few foundations, a nearby cemetery and an old railroad tunnel. Due to deterioration, the majority of the tunnels were abandoned, with some filled in for safety reasons. Now only a few remain open, one of which is famously known for being haunted. The railroads were the only route to Moonville, but throughout the years many people have died near the tunnel and train tracks. This is due to the fact that the tunnels were so narrow it was not possible for pedestrians to walk alongside the tracks in the tunnel while a train was passing through, which resulted in numerous fatalities. It is said that the Moonville Tunnel is haunted by ghosts of locals who died from being struck by passing trains. Legend has it the ghost of a man who was killed instantly by a train passing through the tunnel wanders along the track bed near the old tunnel at night. One of the most famous deaths at the tunnel comes from a brakeman worker. Around 1859, a brakeman for the railway fell asleep, and sometime during the night, he was awakened by the sound of his train leaving the depot. He arose, stumbling onto the train track and falling beneath the wheels of the train. The brakeman never recovered from his injuries, and the ghost of the man is said to be stumbling down the tracks within the tunnel with a lantern in hand, still trying to catch the train before it leaves Moonville Station. This is why most who claim to have sighted the ghost of Moonville Tunnel say that he carries a lantern and is sometimes seen as a hovering orb of light. In at number three, we have Melon Heads. Melon Heads is the name given to the urban legend of human like beings that live in the forests of Michigan, Connecticut, and Ohio. The Melon Heads were originally abandoned children that a scientist by the name of Dr. Crow decided to take care of at his facility in Kirtland, Ohio. While the children stayed at the facility, Dr. Crow performed experiments. What got them the name Melon Heads was when Dr. Crow injected chemicals into their brains, which caused their craniums to grow abnormally large. Because of the abnormal growth, they developed hydrocephalus, which caused them to become mentally ill. After years of neglect, the Melon Heads ended Dr. Crow's life and burned down his facility. After the death of the mad scientist Dr. Crow, the Melon Heads decided to inhabit the forest of Crybaby Bridge. To survive, the Melon Heads feast on any animals that they hunted down. Because of their paranoia of society, the Melon Heads ate anyone that spotted them. To keep the Melon Heads cult going, they've kept inbreeding, making the offspring even more raving and paranoid. Legend holds that the Melon Heads reside in Wisner Road in Kirtland and Chardon Township, with locals and bypassers reported seeing and hearing the Melon Heads as they lurk in the forest looking for their next victim. Local lore depicts them as a territorial and angry, responsible for attacks, kidnappings, and theft of pets and livestock for food. An explorer even wrote a book about the first person encounter with Melon Head. Kelly Topradosian claims that she was exploring the grounds of the then abandoned Felt Mansion and her friends one night when she saw a small human in the distance. They had an unusually large head, but she 
she wasn't scared. Then he started walking towards them. In at number two, we have Myrtle Hill Cemetery. Residing in Cleveland, Ohio, the Myrtle Hill Cemetery is one mysterious and scary resting place. This legend starts with a three foot round granite memorial that pays homage to a witch by the name of Stoskopf. Local legends explain that old lady Stoskopf murdered her family and tossed them in a well. When the townsfolk discovered the grisly truth, they sentenced her to death. When she was buried, she was buried standing up, and a massive grain stone was placed above her to weigh her spirit down. Though that being said, the legend was likely inspired by the real life slayings carried out by Martha Wise. Martha poisoned her family's water supply and ultimately killed three family members, only a mere mile away from where the witch's ball stands today. Early on, Wise claimed the devil made her do it, with the plain dealer reporting more than 125 witnesses were called to testify to Wise's insanity, stating that sometimes she barked like a dog and frothed at the mouth, that she wandered the woods at night and caught several barns on fire. Wise served most of the rest of her life in Marysville Reformatory, where she died at 89 in 1971. Although she's buried in Marysville, her victims are all buried within a couple of hundred feet of the Stoskopf Spherical Monument, which wasn't installed, according to local residents, until at least the early 1940s. Locals say that if you touch the stone at night and it's warm, it means that the witch has escaped and she's on the hunt for her next victim. Many can't help but believe that the cemetery itself is haunted, and out of curiosity, many people visit the cemetery and trespass at night to try to interact with its resident spirits. And finally, in at number one, we have Rogue's Hollow. From the tales of a haunted mill and a cryberry bee bridge to a shaking graveyard and a headless horseman, Rogue's Hollow is known to be one of Ohio's most haunted areas. You can explore the park today, just be sure to stay away after dark, as that's when the ghosts come out to play. Ohio Rogue's Hollow was once a populated mining village, but very few remnants of the coal mining town remain now. The town was actually once a place notorious for outlaws and gangsters to hide out. Shootouts and robberies were common here, and these continued until the early 20th century. In spite of the town's crooked reality and a peculiar tale, creepy things continue to happen here. There have been multiple reports of sounds of a crying baby at night, shaking grounds at a graveyard, and ghost sightings that haunt the abandoned town. The abandoned mines around Rogue's Hollow are full of ghosts of miners who perish there in cave-ins and accidents, with the reports of tools being picked up by unseen hands in the black shafts chipping away at veins of coal. Though the entrance to the mine has been permanently blocked, and the walkway near the mine shafts are equally plagued by residents of the spirit world. One old legend that haunts the town is of the Chidester Mill ghost. The ghost was believed to belong to a mill worker who fell into the wheel and was crushed beneath the churning waves. The ghost guarded the area and is filled with jealousy and spite. Because of the negative energy this ghost brings, he supposedly started a fire in the Chidester house when an outsider expressed interest in purchasing it. A more modern legend is the Crybaby Bridge. At the bottom of the hollow, a bridge crosses Silver Creek. According to legend, a car traveling across the bridge slid on ice and plunged into the creek. Its occupants were no longer alive. Today, you can hear the cries being heard from the surrounding woods. There are an endless amount of ghost stories circulating about the old mining town of Rogue's Hollow, with eyewitnesses reported seeing women in frontier dresses, hearing old trains, crying and floating tools, leaving us even more certain in the belief of ghosts and spirits. Number 5. The Screaming Bridge Now our first Texan urban legend is a long told story based on a real tragedy. The accident on Screaming Bridge. Jeez, if that is not a name, that sounds more like it belongs on Hogwarts campus than it does somewhere in Texas. Over 50 years ago, several students were carpooling home after their football team defeated their rivals in a major victory. The students were riding high, celebrating, and were definitely not concerned with driving safely. I mean, come on, they just won the big game. Who wouldn't be celebrating? The bridge running through Arlington's River Legacy Park was wide enough to accommodate Maybe one car at a time, if that. And the students were hollering and hooting and not even remotely looking at the road, drowning out the outside world and focused on themselves and this beautiful moment in time, not worrying about their future, their surroundings, the car speeding towards them. Unfortunately, by the time anyone could realize what was happening, it was too late to stop it. The cars collided, erupting in a horrifying explosion, claiming the lives tragically of every single person involved in this crash. Now this bridge can only be accessed by foot now. It was then given the name Screaming Bridge. 
in honor of the horrible events that had happened up there. Now local legends state that if you do journey up to Screaming Bridge and you stand looking right over at the river, you'll be able to see the apparitions of tombstones of all the victims. Goes a little further though. Visit up at midnight on the day of the crash, the anniversary. They say you're able to hear the screeching of the cars and the screaming of the victims Hence, Screaming Bridge. Scary, scary stuff. I'm probably going to take a little detour if I'm ever down in Arlington. I, I think I'm good. I'm sure there are plenty of non-haunted bridges for me to keep my feet on. And if you're looking for way more scary content, Top 5 Scary is the place to be. We've got urban legends from across the globe, horror movies, true tales, cryptids, ghosts, aliens, just about everything scary you could shake a stick at. So stay subscribed, but way more importantly, stay scared. And hey, Stay watching this video, okay, before you check out the rest of the channel. We got way more cryptids and urban legends to go. Number four, the Chupacabra. The Chupacabra is one of my absolute favorite cryptids out there. I love the variants and sightings and legends because sometimes, depending on who's telling the story, the Chupacabra is described as being like an alien, reptilian, like horrible little goblin guy that runs around on all fours and is from another planet and sucking all the goats. And then sometimes in some stories, the Chupacabra is just like a weird looking dog. I love it. Not all cryptids need complicated lore, sometimes they're just a weird looking dog. Now legends of the Chupacabra stemmed initially from Puerto Rico. Most cryptozoologists believe with stories dating back to the 1970s. Livestock was found going missing all around this one small town, Mocha, and were initially assumed to be the work of some cult, but later reported to be thought to be the cause of an animal, as all the livestock found had bite marks and their bodies bled dry. Now the name Chupacabra literally translates to goat sucker, which is so funny that when you learn that it is impossible to ever unlearn that. Now this creature is a widespread phenomenon reported across the southwest and Mexico Mexico, but Texas of all places seems to be a real hotbed for the creature. One very determined author, Ben Radford, who's a researcher at the Center for Skeptical Inquiry, and he even penned a book appropriately titled Tracking the Chupacabra, says that Texas is a chupacabra factory, one of the foremost places in the world associated with the beast. One of the more recent sightings and one of the more viral ones that was going around was a few years ago in Amarillo, a zoo security camera captured weird footage of a creature standing on its back legs that looks a whole lot like a chupacabra or Crash Bandicoot. You decide for yourself. Number three, the black eyed children. Our next entry details the paranormal sighting of a cryptid called the black eyed children. Nailing down the first earliest sighting of black eyed children ever is difficult since there are some conflicting reports, but most people tend to agree that the first widely like recognized instance of this was from a journalist in Texas in 1996 all the way down in Abilene. Brian Bethel was a journalist working at the time and he said he stopped in a parking lot near a movie theater to write a check. He heard a knocking on the door of his car and he looked up from his pen and paper and said, and I quote, I'm quoting him on this, he said he felt a soul racking fear looking out at a boy and his younger brother. The boy told Bethel that he and his younger brother both wanted to catch a movie, but they didn't have any money. Bethel was uncomfortable with this, but dismissed it as just having the jitters. The two kids told him that, hey, we're just kids, nothing to be scared of, and that they didn't have any weapons, which is, you know, that's a totally normal thing that kids would say to you in a parking lot all the time to calm you down. Bethel told the boys that the movie they wanted to see was already playing and they wouldn't be able to make it in time. And since this was in 1996, we could only speculate on what they wanted to see, but I'm pretty sure it was the Arnold Schwarzenegger classic jingle all the way. Anyway, Bethel said when he broke eye contact with the young little weirdos, he found himself completely swallowed by his own fear. The boy's eyes then became completely black, obsidian as midnight on a moonless night. Bethel's story kickstarted a number of sightings of these black eyed children across Texas and even showing up in other states. No one's got any idea just what they were or what they wanted really, like what are they? What are their goals? Were they even human or just creatures sort of masquerading as humans? And did they really just want to see a movie and maybe he should have just driven them down to the cineplex? We may never get answers on that one. Number two, the candy lady. Now our next story is a real sweet one. It details an old urban legend about a nightmarish figure named the candy lady. Does she know the candy man, do you reckon? I bet they would be a great fit for each other if anyone wants to set that blind date up. Anywho, 
The Candy Lady, despite the sweet nickname, was a ruthless criminal with little regard for her victims. Her real name was Clara Crane, but history remembers her as the Candy Lady since that's way scarier. Get ready for a humdinger of a ghost story. In 1895, she was accused of poisoning her husband by slipping him caramel candies that she had laced with something lethal. Now, a couple years before, this young couple had lost their child causing Clara to become distraught. Clara blamed her husband for what had happened to the child, leading her to add a little extra sugar to his sweets. Oh, I'm, I'm making light of this, that's terrible. If she poisoned her husband, that's just terrible. I don't wanna joke about that. Clara was deemed unfit for trial and was placed in the North Texas Lunatic Asylum, which, don't worry, thankfully received the much more pleasant name as Terrell State Hospital down the line. I can't believe that's ever what it was called before. Imagine getting sent to the North Texas Lunatic Asylum. Unfortunately, her stay at the North Texas Lunatic Asylum would not be the end of her legacy. I just wanted to say it again one more time. I'm sorry. Can you, can you blame me? In 1903, people started going missing around the town Clara lived in. Bizarrely, relatives of the victims would report finding candies and candy wrappers around their home. Sometimes there would even be threatening little notes on these candies. Locals started speaking again of Clara Crane, the woman who infamously poisoned her husband with dark candies years back. Now here's where it gets bone chilling. A nearby farmer found a bunch of teeth in his fields and then discovered the body of the town sheriff in his field without his chompers and forks in his eyes and candy in his pockets. <laughs> now, no one knows what truly became of Clara Crane, there's not really a lot of records for this thing, but she's become a great ghost story to locals who tell the tale of her luring people away with her sweet little treats and taking their teeth and eyes in return. Oh my god, that's giving me a toothache just talking about it. We have to move on from this one, otherwise I'm gonna have to book a dentist appointment soon. Ah, okay, moving on, moving on, moving on. <laughs> Number one, the donkey lady. I saved the best for last. Our last entry is the bizarre legend of the donkey lady. Now there's a few variations on the origin of the donkey lady, but the stories always end up the same horrible way. And we'll get there in just a minute. But let's take it all the way back to the start. And to go back to the start, we gotta go sometime in the mid 1800s. The story goes that there was a family that lived near Elm Creek, way down in San Antonio. They had a modest farm property, a husband, a wife, and their children. One day, a $5 man from up north rode past their property and taunted the family for the donkey that they had. Not sure why you'd do that. He's clearly never seen a fistful of dollars. You never make fun of a man's mule. It's the fastest way to end up in a coffin. Anyway, the mule didn't take too kindly to being laughed at and bit the man over his taunting. This man was enraged and beat the donkey within an inch of its life, at which point the mother of the family came out and started to pelt rocks at this strange traveling donkey hater. The man couldn't just leave well enough alone because as legend goes, later that night he brought a posse back to come burn down the farmhouse and blocked up all the exits to burn them inside. All over a donkey, allegedly. The farmhouse went up in flames. The only survivor, tragically, was the wife who initially had come to the donkey's defense. And she ran out of the home, her skin soaked in flame, her hands melted down to little stubs, her face deformed, skin sagging off the muscle, crispy and black, long, like a donkey's snout. She ran into the night and hurled herself into the Elm Creek, which is the last place anyone had ever seen her. Today, there's a bridge called Donkey Lady Bridge over Elm Creek, where locals claim that they've seen a creature with a donkey's face screaming at them from the window of their car. Legend has it that the spirit of the wife haunts this area and torments those who cross her bridge while grieving the unfortunate loss of her family. Number five on this list is the mutual Nick House. A ghost has a firm grip over this house and refuses to let go of it. Legends of America says, built in 1885, this old home was host to frequent Saturday night parties. On one such evening, the event ran into the wee hours of Sunday morning. Having been kept up very late, a maid who had worked for the party the prior evening overslept the next morning. Rushing from her bedchamber, she ran down the back staircase to the kitchen and fell to her death. Today, Witnesses report that lights from the back staircase turn on and off by themselves 
on Sunday mornings, followed by the smell of cooking bacon from the kitchen when nobody's there. This house, which serves as an art gallery today, was listed on the National Register of Historic Places on July 12th, 1974, located at 704 North 4th Street. Now apparently the author of this article actually went there personally and they had an interaction with this ghost in person. They say, my husband and I took a guided tour of the Muchnik house two years ago and I had quite an interesting experience. The nice lady who gave us the tour, gave us all the history of the house when I happened to glance up to the top of the stairs and saw a young woman, maybe early 20s, peering over the edge of the banister. She seemed to be regarding us with wary curiosity as if to say, what are you doing here? When we went upstairs to tour the rest of the house, no one was up there. It wasn't until we took the haunted trolley tour that I learned about the young woman who supposedly died there falling down the stairs. I'm surprised that that ghost just looked at them and didn't try to do anything else, to be honest. The ghost could have easily attacked them had she wanted to, but chose not to in that moment, which was much to the benefit of this couple. This house and its urban legend has made it so that no one actually lives here anymore except for the ghost. It's now just a spot for tourists to pop into and take a quick peek, which in all honesty is probably just pissing the ghost off even more if you think about it. Either way, I know that this couple managed to get out unscathed, but I still don't think that going to this place is the best choice. I'd avoid it if you can. Number four on this list is the North 3rd Street home. Nellie Trueblood. That's the name of the person who used to live here. I feel like with a name like that, this place was just destined to be haunted. Nellie was a lonely person who died alone in this house many years ago. One would think that because she was so lonely, after she died, she wouldn't have wanted to cling to this world anymore, but that's exactly what she did. The new owners bought and moved into this house and then started renovating it. Well, apparently Nellie wasn't too fond with changing things up and liked it the way that it was. Balls of light that were roughly two feet wide would appear out of thin air and bounce around the home, scaring the living bejesus out of the workers who were sent to renovate it. This was enough for those guys to end the renovations prematurely and leave the house unfinished. Apparently, a family member of Nellie's would later come out and say that they weren't surprised she still haunts this place. This home was deeply loved by the family, and it would make sense that she would want to keep it the way that it is. The family member assured people that she wouldn't hurt anyone, but after seeing the orbs, no one was buying into it. This home was officially listed as unlivable thanks to Nellie and her ghostly presence. Stay away from this place if you don't want Nellie and her orbs to come I'm after you. Number three on this list is Theater Atchison. The people of Kansas are gonna need to be looking to find their live performances elsewhere if they don't want to get haunted. Legends of America says, built in 1913 as the first Church of Christ, the building was modeled after the architectural lines of its mother church in Boston. In 1973, the Presbyterian Church bought the building and 10 years later, they created a community theater organization. Today, the building is known as the Presbyterian Community Center and is home to Theater Atchison. Allegedly, it is also home to an unearthly spirit. Guests often describe feeling an unknown presence with them while visiting the theater, while others working in the building describe odd noises that are often heard that have no apparent earthly cause. The word unearthly makes me pause for a second there. That makes me think that we might not even be dealing with a standard ghost or spirit here, but something far worse. Some type of underworld creature that is coming to harvest people's souls. Or something similar, but from a completely different planet. Now, why an alien would decide to conduct its devilish acts inside a Kansas theater is beyond me, but I guess I'm not from another planet, so I wouldn't know. This is more than just the Shakespearean Macbeth curse, folks. This is evil and dangerous and it's not something that you want to mess with. Number two on this list is the gargoyle home. I think gargoyles are pretty dope, honestly. They're really cool and super fun to look at, 
Maybe just not on my home though. Legends of America says, more often referred to as the Wagner House, this turn of the century home was built in 1884 and 1885 by B.P. Wagner, who was a lawyer and politician in the Atchison area in the late 1800s. While gargoyles are usually erected to scare off evil spirits, legend has it that Wagner accumulated his wealth through a deal with the devil and the gargoyles were constructed in honor of the pact. It's said that the house is afflicted by an evil curse. One homeowner who attempted to remove the gargoyles fell to his death on the staircase. A segment on the Travel Channel reported that Kansas City ghost hunters, while visiting the home, picked up the presence of ghosts on their special equipment and reported having felt a presence in the house. This house was placed on the National Register of Historic Places on May 3rd, 1974, located at 8 19 North 4th Street. So nobody knows if the gargoyles are the thing causing the curse or if it's just a coincidence that they're there. Either way, having them there seriously adds to the mystery and ominous presence that is this home. Especially considering the second someone tried to take them down, that person literally died. I'm happy that no one is living in this place now and it's on the National Register thing or whatever, but that also means that this home isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Like this house is going to be here haunting people and maybe even taking unsuspecting people's lives for a long time. That's a really scary thought. Hopefully we can get some more professionals in here to figure out what is causing this haunting for good and how to stop it. And number one on this list is Jackson Park. Parks are supposed to be nice guys. This one... It isn't. Legends of America says a woman by the name of Molly is said to haunt this park. Supposedly, moaning and terrifying screams can be heard throughout the park around midnight. According to one legend, Molly was a beautiful young woman found dead in the park the day after her prom. She was found hanging by her neck to a park tree in a hollow with badly torn clothes. Allegedly, she and her date had argued the night before, and when Molly exited the car, her date drove off, leaving her in the park. It was never determined if her death was by her own hand or was murder. Though some suspected that her prom date killed her, nobody was ever charged. Another legend of the park's haunting states that Molly was a black woman who was lynched by a white mob years ago. Rather than the eerie screams of a young prom girl, the cries instead come from the brutal slaying of an African American Molly. In any case, the area today is known as Molly's Hollow, a couple's go-to park. In addition, to Molly's chilling cries, many witnesses also claim to have seen a ghostly figure hanging in the tree where her body was discovered. Either one of those stories are bad and would have left their mark. So it makes sense why this place is the way that it is now. The pictures of this place are really pretty too and it would definitely be a go-to date spot. You just have to be really careful that your romantic picnic doesn't get sinister and paranormal really fast. Coming in at number 5 we have the Night Marches. The Huaka Ipo, also known as the night marches are murderous shades, demons, and revenants that haunt the islands. These undead spirits are the fighters, heroes, and warriors of ancient Hawaii, who are well known throughout the Hawaiian legends. These warriors are believed to be eternally fated to march the islands, seeking their next battle. They are most active at night, but also have been reported to be seen during the day. No structure deters their path, and as a result, they are often seen walking right through buildings. Some think that these restless souls are looking to reclaim claim rightful territory, replay a battle gone awry, or avenge their own deaths. While others say that night marchers are searching methodically for an entrance into the next world. Night marchers are said to roam through very specific locations and are often recognized by their raised torches and repeated chants, although there have been a few scattered reports of daytime marches. Moreover, the night marchers are thought to come out during periods of heavy wind, rain and high surf, and fog or mist often accompanies them on their journey. Journey. It is also thought that the night marches appear on certain nights designated by the moon, including Poakua, the 14th night of the new moon, and the nights of Kane, Ku, Lono, and Kanaloa. Although the night marches allegedly float a few inches.
inches off the ground, some local accounts tell of seeing mysterious footprints in their path after they had passed. But where there was legend has it that resting your eyes upon the night marchers could signal a grim fate for the perpetrator, a friend or a relative, so witnesses are urged to crouch low to the ground, freeze and don't look into their eyes. Any sound or movement could invite a night marcher's deadly glance. These night marchers are set diligently upon their destination and are not considered spirits that will deviate from their path to haunt humans nearby. Therefore you must also be perfectly silent and still, for any sudden sound or movement could invite the deadly glance of a night marcher. If you make eye contact with the night marchers, you will die and be forced to march with them for an eternity. Coming in at number 4 we have Haunted Pei Highway. Pei Highway is known as a historic site and urban legend attached to it. The highway runs through the district of Nuuanu, a valley between the Koalau mountain range on Leeward, Oahu, and it was there that this decisive battle unfolded. Hundreds of warriors fought in the battle. Years later, during the initial development of what would eventually become the Pali Highway, more than 800 human remains were recovered. Some believe that the spirits of those warriors continue to haunt the area. Pali Highway is a staple of local urban legends and a popular spot for paranormal activity. People report coming back with photos of orbs or white mist or stories of supernatural encounters. One of the most common stories associated with the highway warns people not to take pork over the Pali. This is because it is known that if you try to bring pork across, your car will stop at some point along the journey and an old woman with a dog will appear. To continue on your way, you must feed the pork to the dog. While another story about the area describes two large stones at the start of the Pali Trail. These stones, according to the legends, were considered goddesses who took the form of these stone sentries to guard the Pali. Travelers would leave offerings in exchange for safe passage, and women would bury the umbilical cords of their newborns as protection from evil spirits. In at number 3 we have the Menihune. According to Hawaiian oral traditions, the Menihune were an ancient race of Polynesian people who inhabited the Hawaiian Islands before the first voyagers arrived. While there are no written accounts or skeletal remains of the Menihune, many Hawaiian legends reference them as mythical people of small stature and great strength. According to mythology, Menihune lived deep in the forests of Kauai and other Hawaiian islands. The Menihune are a mischievous group of small people who roamed the deep forest at night and are said to be about 2 feet tall, though some were as tiny as 6 inches, small enough to fit in the palm of a hand. They enjoy dancing, singing and archery, and their favourite foods are bananas and fish. According to local legend, these small creatures are extremely industrious, master builders who are able to use their massive strength to accomplish great feats of construction and engineering in a matter of hours. The Menihune worked at night so ancient Hawaiians would not discover them. Their work would be abandoned if they were caught. Legend has it that the Menihune were capable of completing major projects in a single night, and they are credited with the construction of the Elacoco fish pond. Though referred to as the Menihune fish pond, archaeologists believe the site was constructed 1,000 years ago and that the stones used in its construction came from more than 25 miles away. If not credited to be built by the Menihune, its construction is a mystery. Another structure with mysterious Menihue ties on Kauai is the Kikiola Irrigation Ditch located in Waimea. While ancient Hawaiians are known for their stone crafted irrigation systems for growing taro, the Menihune Ditch is a fascinating archaeological find because of the type and cut of stone used to create it. Instead of uncut or roughly shaped lava rock, the Menihune Ditch is constructed of finely carved basalt stones. In addition to their handiwork, the Menihune have been known to use magic arrows to pierce the heart of angry people, igniting feelings of love instead. They also enjoy cliff diving, and according to local lore, they were smart, extremely strong, and excellent craftsmen, though because they worked at night, they were rarely seen by human eyes. Coming in at number 2, we have the Green Lady. By day, the Wahiawa Botanical Garden is a beautiful destination for those wanting to see lush tropical flora. Nearby, however, is home to a legend of a much more ghastly site. If you decide to peer down into the nearby gulch at twilight, you may just see a glimpse of the local legendary Obake or Ghost, the Green Lady of Wahiawa. The story of the Green Lady takes place in the Wahiawa Botanical Garden, where one day while taking a shortcut through the nearby garden, the woman became separated from one of her children in the dense and dark forest. Unable to find her child, she lost her life of heartbreak and disappeared. Now she wanders the area and is said to snatch people that she finds playing in the garden and forest in an attempt to replace her own lost family. Reports of the Green Lady describes her as a monstrous woman with green tinted skin. Her clothing and long black hair are covered in moss and seaweed, and her approach is heralded by the stench of the decaying plant matter that covers her. There have been sightings of a green woman in the forest, and the last known sighting was in the 1980s. People in Wahia sometimes dare each other to run across the bridge, as the story says that the Green Lady will come up on the bridge to take people away. The ghost has even been seen on the outskirts of Waihau Elementary
Elementary School, which is located on the edge of the gulch. And finally, in at number one, we have Pele's Curse. Moving towards one of the most known urban legends of Hawaii, we have Pele's Curse. Pele is known as the Hawaiian goddess of fire, lightning, wind, dance, and volcanoes. Her home is believed to be on the Halamaumau crater at the summit of the Kalauea volcano. Pele is often portrayed as a wanderer, and sightings of the familiar and popular goddess have been reported throughout the island chain for hundreds of years, but especially near volcanic craters and near the home of Kalauea, one of the most active volcanoes in the world. In these sightings, she appears as a very tall, beautiful young woman or an unattractive and frail elderly woman, usually accompanied by a white dog. Those well versed in the legend say that Pele takes this form of an elderly beggar woman to test people, asking them if they have food or drink to share. Those who are generous and share with her are rewarded, while anyone who is greedy or unkind is punished with their homes or other valuables destroyed. She is known for her passion and temper, with many visitors reporting hearing stories of her power and destruction. The legend of Pele's curse says that anyone who removes anything natively Hawaiian, like pieces of rock or sand from the Hawaiian islands, will feel the wrath of Pele, who views the rocks as her children. Legend has it that if you take from Pele, you will incur years of bad luck. It is said that Pele's wrath is stimulated by jealousy or arrogance. Some believe the myth of Pele's curse was actually invented by park rangers on the big island of Hawaii because they were tired of visitors making off with bits of the island. Many people, including local residents, believe that Pele's curse is just a legend. However, to this day, hundreds of pieces of lava rock are mailed back to the big island as a result of those who claim they have experienced bad luck and misfortune due to the curse they received when stealing from the island. Number five on this list is Stull's Gateway to Hell. Anything named Stull was just doomed from the start, guys. Thrillist says the tiny town of Stull has counted very few residents since it was founded in 1856. The most famous is rumored to be Lucifer himself, who some say appears at the town cemetery on Halloween and spring equinox. They say he uses the site where a roofless church once stood as a portal to and from hell. Some say that he's drawn to the site of frequent witch hangings. Others believe one of the graves actually contains Satan's own child. Either way, new graves continue to be dug despite signs warning against trespassers, perhaps referring directly to the Prince of Darkness himself or the cults that are rumored to flock to the grounds. The first published article about the horrors are traced back to a 1974 article in the University Daily Kansan, though whispers about evil have persisted since 1900 or so. In 1998, the hanging tree was torn down to stop people from visiting. It hasn't lessened the need for a small town to bolster an annual police presence to deter visitors looking for a glimpse of the devil himself. So we have witch hangings here, we have cults that flock here, and then we also have the worst thing of all, the literal devil potentially calling this place home. How could somebody decide to name a town Stull? That is way too close to the word skull and it's just destined for failure. People have been smart enough not to live here all that much, and as Thrillist has said, the residents are few and far between, but it doesn't change the fact that this place is deeply haunted. If the devil truly does live here and there is a portal to hell, then there's no telling what other crazy things can happen here. Maybe there are a few residents around because the devil has been taking them. I also think it's interesting that there are more police around this place. Why would there be a bunch of police around an area where there isn't that many people? Maybe the government knows something about this place that we don't. Maybe they're hiding something and don't want locals finding out. It's just a theory, but based on the rumors around this place, I could believe it. Number three on this list is Sawyer Castle. Sawyer Castle is currently haunted by the ghosts of two lovers who left this world far too soon. Ranker says, this haunted Kansas mansion has many gruesome tales attached to it, but certainly the most awful one involves the tragic suicides committed by a husband and wife during the Civil War. The owner of the house had gone to fight and instructed his wife to wait for the arrival of a particular ferry that he would be coming home on. When her husband did not return on that ferry, she assumed him dead and hung herself in the bell tower. However, he was in fact still alive, and upon his arriving home, he found his wife dead and killed himself out of misery. It's said that strange lights and noises emanate from the house's bell tower to this day. This story is very similar to that of a classic play, Romeo and Juliet. Two lovers, held apart by something out of their control, take their own life in what is a clear miscommunication. Even though this was horrible, I suppose that they sort of got what they wanted. Now they're together forever, but just in ghost form. Of course, they can't just let this lie though and have to haunt this place and ruin everyone else's life who's still living here. Maybe they think that because they're still together and technically still around, that they should own the home and anyone in it that's not them is a trespasser. Whatever it is that they think, they make it very 
difficult for those who go around here. I'd avoid this place altogether if I was you. Number two on this list is Fort Leavenworth. What happened here back in the day is enough to make anyone's hair raise. Ranker says Fort Leavenworth is considered to be one of the most haunted army bases in the US and it's home to a number of helpful and malignant spirits. It has seen centuries of war and is home to a military prison called the United States Disciplinary Barracks. During World War II there was a prisoner uprising and as punishment for their unruliness one prisoner was hung every hour for 14 hours. They quickly ran out of space in the gallows and also used one of the elevator shafts in the administration building to hang people. Ever since then, screams have been heard from that same elevator shaft at odd hours. Not surprisingly, nearly every building on the base has a horrifying story attached to it. I know that it was war and they were trying to have an uprising, but my gosh, hanging one person an hour? Like, that is just so brutal. No wonder this place is deeply haunted now. All of the spirits from back then are locked into this place and refuse to let go. And you better believe that they make the people who are still around pay for what happened in the past. People have reportedly been attacked by invisible spirits before. They've been clawed at and bitten and one person even had their finger ripped right off of their body. Things are not pleasant at this army base and I'm kind of surprised that it hasn't been raised to the ground yet. Might be the only thing left to do to quiet these spirits down. And finally, Finally, number one on this list is the Ghost of Saline River. You already know that this is going to be a scary legend when they have a name like that. Ranker says, according to legend, a Native American ghost by the name of Takaluma is said to walk the banks of the Saline River and was first spotted by a cowboy in the winter of 1879. Takaluma's spirit was condemned to wander the river until he found the skull of his dead father, who had been murdered by white men in the 1840s. The ghost rose from his burial mound and warned that far more powerful spirits might might join in the search, but the skull has still never been found. What a horrible fate. Your father gets murdered and then you have to spend the rest of your existence as a ghost wandering around this river searching for his skull. This ghost was once a calm presence, but time has made Takaluma angry. Now it's said that this ghost will drag unsuspecting victims into the river and drown them, then take their skull and see if he can convince the other spirits that it's his father's. This has never worked before, but when you have a literal eternity, I suppose suppose you'll try anything. A beautiful river to look at from a distance, but not one that you want to get too close to. Coming in at number five, we have Hell's Gate in Oxford. Known as the most haunted bridge, we have Hell's Gate in Oxford, Alabama. Hell's Gate Bridge earned its name because many people believe that when you stop on the bridge and glance over your shoulder, the road behind you resembles the fiery gates of hell. Several locals have experienced this over the years. But that isn't all of it. The most popular urban legend about this bridge takes place during the 1950s when a young couple couple's car drove off the bridge and into the water below. Supposedly if you stop on the bridge and turn off your lights, a member of the couple will enter your vehicle and leave a wet spot on the seat. The bridge was officially closed to traffic in late 2005 and early 2006 when the new road known as Leon Smith Parkway was built from Friendship Road to the Oxford Exchange connecting it to the new outdoor mall. On Saturday January 13, 2007 the legend of the bridge lives on as after it was closed the OPS team decided to go to this bridge and investigate the paranormal activity claims. The team arrived at the site around 10pm and placed voice recorders on each end of the bridge in the middle. They set up a webcam suited for night viewing and took lots of pictures with the digital and 35mm cameras. They wrapped up their investigation sometime after midnight. After going through the evidence, they did not detect anything that night, though one of the members did see an object coming toward the group while we were sitting on the end of a bridge. And just because nothing suspicious was caught that night doesn't mean it isn't haunted. Coming in at number 4 we have the vanishing of Orion Williamson. This urban legend is different from most and revolves around the farmer Orion Williamson. One hot July afternoon in 1854, Orion was walking on his farm near Selma. Reportedly, Williamson's wife and family were on the front porch of the farmhouse. Then, neighbors passed by and waved to Williamson, who was walking in ankle deep grass. Orion waved back before vanishing right before the eyes of his family and neighbors. The party ran to the site, frantically searching, but found no sign of Williamson. Soon, a search party was formed, and 300 men are said to have come to search for the farmer. No sign of Orion material 
materialized even though the effort continued well into the night. As news of the inexplicable vanishment spread, more volunteers and a team of geologists arrived. They dug up the field to see if the ground was in any way unstable or unusual. There was only solid rock a few feet below the surface. No holes, crevices or cave-ins, nothing that could explain the event. Reportedly, Mrs. Williamson and her son could hear Orion's voice calling for help for weeks afterward, growing fainter and fainter. Each time they would rush out onto the field only to find nothing. Gradually Orion's voice faded into a mere whisper, then disappeared forever. After no amount of searching turned up anything, the judge declared Orion dead. The following spring, it is said, a circle of dead grass appeared to mark the spot of the unlucky farmer's disappearance. The German scientist Maximilian Hearn, author of the book Disappearance and Theory Thereof, speculated that Orion walked into a spot of universal ether. He believed these places lasted a few seconds and could completely destroy all matter within them. Another scientist theorized a magnetic field had disintegrated Orion's atomic structure and sent him into another dimension. In a number two, we have Hugging Molly. This urban legend comprises of the witch of Hugging Molly, haunting the town of Abeville, Alabama. Legend claims that a phantom woman would appear to children, but only at night. The witch would squeeze them tightly and then proceed to scream in their ears, though she never harmed them other than causing ringing in their ears. Molly had been described as a seven feet figure, wearing dark clothes and a wide brimmed hat. Jimmy Rain, an Abeville local and lifelong resident, grew up hearing the legend of Hugging Molly. For him and his friends, she was more than just an urban legend, but a real ghost haunting the grounds of his town. One night, Jimmy and his good friend Tommy Murphy heard the story from Tommy's dad. His dad told them he knew Hugging Molly was real because she had sprung from the shadows and hugged him one night. They were convinced it had to be true. Who Molly is is still up for debate, but many believe that she lost her own children and go after local children to make up for the lost time with her own child. Some say her ghost still walks the street of Abel late in the night, sweeping her black skirt as she goes. And finally, in at number one, we have Slag of Sloss Furnace. From 1882 to 1971, Birmingham Sloss Furnaces transformed coal and ore from surrounding acres into the hard steel that would pave the way for the Industrial Revolution. In the early 1900s, James Slag's Wormwood was foreman of the graveyard shift, the period between sunset and sunrise, where he was in charge of a crew of nearly 150 workers. During the summer months, the temperatures throughout the plant would reach more than 120 degrees. Lack of sleep, the heat and low visibility made working the furnace literally a living hell and only the poorest of workers desperate for employment would work it. To impress his supervisors, James Slack would make his workers take dangerous risks, forcing them to speed up production. During his reign, 47 workers lost their lives, 10 times more than any other shift in the history of the furnace. Countless others lost their ability to work due to accidents, mishaps and even a recorded explosion in the small blowing engine house in 1888 that left six workers burned blind. In October of 1906, James Slag's Wormwood lost his footing at the top of the highest blast furnace and plummeted into a pool of melted iron ore, where he melted instantly. It was reported that Slag must have become dizzy from the methane gas created by the furnace and lost his balance, but Slag had never set foot on top of the furnace during his years of employment, leaving the death of James still a mystery. The legend of Slag's grew each year after his disappearance. Workers complained of an unnatural presence. They increasingly encountered throughout the work site. One work reports that on a night watchman in 1926, they sustained injuries after being pushed from behind and told angrily by deep voice to get back to work. The man upon searching the grounds could find no sign of any other living person, only to assume it was the spirit of James Slag. Another suspicious story happened in 1947 when three supervisors turned up missing, where they would be found unconscious and locked in the small boiler room in the southeastern part of the plant. None of the three could explain exactly what happened to them. All agreed they were approached by a man whose skin appeared badly burnt and who angrily shouted at them to push some steel. Probably the most horrifying tale occurred in 1971 when the night before the plant closed, Samuel Blumenthal, the Sloss Night Watchman, who was nostalgically taking a last look about, found himself face to face with what he recalls being the most frightening thing he had ever seen. He described it simply as evil and a half man half demon who tried to push him up the stairs. When Blumenthal refused, the monster began to hit him. In in addition, another investigation was held in 2003 by the Alabama Foundation for Paranormal Research, who insisted that there is no doubt paranormal activity on the grounds of the plant. During their investigations, they pulled data that confirms through scientific methods that the spirit entities are present and cannot be explained, while also stating that Sloss is one of the most paranormally active places our team has investigated. 